From the nation's capital, the Conservative Caucus presents Conservative Roundtable, an in-depth look at today's most important issues. Welcome to Conservative Roundtable. I'm Howard Phillips. We're privileged to have as our guest for this broadcast the author of two very significant books, actually the co-author. His name is Ed Timberlake. Ed is a former fighter pilot and congressional investigator. And these books have something in common, one with the other. They're about the security and survival of the United States of America. Ed, you have, in addition to your distinguished military career, uh, worked closely with two outstanding members of the United States Congress, <laughs> That's uh, for sure. Jerry Solomon and Absolutely. Dan Burton. And uh, tell us how you became involved in the whole question of the red Chinese threat to the security of the United States of America. Well, I, after uh, graduating from the Naval Academy, flew very briefly in Southeast Asia until I got sick, came back and got a graduate degree at Cornell. Uh, I then continued to fly in the reserves, uh, but wound up here in Washington uh, in the intelligence community, where I worked under contract to the director of net assessment in the Pentagon and the Central Intelligence Agency. My mission then was as a mid-level staffer to uh, analyze the, um, the weapons of the Soviet Empire, what they were capable of doing to America. I was blessed with two appointments from Ronald Reagan, uh, the first one to help my fellow Vietnam veterans, but the second one I was principal director of mobilization for Secretary Weinberger in the Pentagon. Mr. Bush uh, also brought me on board and I was an assistant secretary called into the White House during Desert Storm, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, where we had a communications task force and our mission was to explain uh, the goals of that uh, war to the American people to, to rally them to our, our cause and we worked. It, it, it was very successful. Uh, I then was picked up after, thank God, uh, the House uh, turned over in 94. Uh, Chairman Solomon, who's an old friend, invited me onto the Rules Committee, where I had national security and, and veterans issues. All of a sudden, a name popped out of nowhere, John Wong. It was uh, just prior to the 96 election. H-U-A-N-G. Yes, sir. It's spelled H-U-A-N-G, but it's pronounced Wong. Uh, a gentleman out of the West Coast uh, who was brought into uh, the Washington environment. He had served uh, as a President Clinton appointee in the Commerce Department. And there was something going on uh, in October in which uh, money was somehow coming into the political process. And very candidly, um, I was assigned by Mr. Solomon to the round table. We had uh, staffers, uh, 11 different committees and subcommittees in October of 96, early November of 96, uh, saying, what happened? Now, the media looks and, and the administration takes great pride in painting all this attack uh, or a challenge or findings of fact as a, a vast conspiracy. No, no. We were sitting at a table watching the First Amendment, the freedom of the press, drive this, and lo and behold, it turned out that we were very concerned about what Mr. Wong's background, what he did, how he got there, what he meant, and where he, where he delivered the goods to President Clinton. Basically, uh, Mr. Wong was a man who had a relatively junior position at the Department of Commerce, but unusual access to the President of the United States, to the White House. He worked with uh, Commerce Secretary Ron Brown, Yes, he did. And, and apparently he was a key link in uh, getting money from very questionable sources. That's correct. Uh, many of which had their genesis in communist China. That's correct. And that went into the Clinton administration. And uh, a reasonable observer could conclude that there ver very well may have been a trade of policy for money. It very well may be that Clinton decisions, which almost without exception, have favored the interests of communist China against the interests of the United States might have had something to do with the money that flowed into Clinton-related coffers, some of it through the activities of John Wong. Is that a, a fair statement? Oh, I think it's uh, pretty accurate. Uh, in fact, there's a whole host of figures that showed up. Uh, Charlie Tree, uh, Johnny Chung, who basically uh, we rate as an honest man now. He's the gentleman that went offshore and met the head of the ARBU, the uh, Chinese Military Intelligence Service, General G, who uh, gave $300,000 and said, we like your president. Now, that's pretty direct. 
Um, <laughs> one issue. I'll, I'll hold this up if you don't mind. I'll Please. show you this. This picture. And which, Red Dragon which, which, Rising. This picture right here of the President of the United States and General Chi was never, ever seen, until it came on this book cover, was never seen in America. Who is General Chi? General Chi is the general who ordered the massacre of the students in Tiananmen 10 years ago. He is directly responsible for that activity. Presidents usually don't meet generals, by the way. They tend to meet heads of state. This And they usually don't meet generals it, who massacre innocent civilians. Nor do they keep the picture secret for the American people. What happened, though, is that that picture was used extensively throughout Asia, as were other of these pictures of the Clinton administration, the president, the and vice they're, president. They're in this book, those yes, pictures. Yes, sir. Which by itself is a reason people should look at this book. Oh, it's, it's, there's some pretty harsh pictures. We should probably leave the book cover on because this is going to the, 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 the homes of Americans and there's some pictures in there of the, the kids, the price they paid and, and what that really shows, how, how ugly the uh, machine gunning and the tanks were to the yeah, let, people. Let me cut right to the chase. Yeah. <clears throat> Just on the evidence that was spread across the pages of even liberal newspapers, it seems to me you could make a reasonable case that the President of the United States was guilty of treason and bribery as well as high crimes and misdemeanors. Why did these issues not get surfaced by the Republican leadership in Congress in the context of the impeachment inquiry? My co-author and I, have, we have a pact. We, we, we won't go over. The treason is a term of art, by the way, in wartime, so we won't use that word. But I will go on the record saying our book uh, and the research and the national media make a very convincing case of bribery at the highest levels. Money exchanging hands in the White House. Uh, favors in, money in, favors out. Um, for a very brief period, I was on Mr. Burton's committee, then I moved to Senator Thompson's committee and came back with Chairman Solomon, who basically was a mainstay, a lion in this, in this fight. And uh, we had the impeachment inquiry. In fact, we met in his office one day. And for a very brief period, it looked, well. it looked like the Congress was going to go ahead with Mr. Shippers for, Gen for Dave Chairman Shippers. Hyde, a great man, a wonderful investigator, and go down this path. And then all of a sudden, they decided, no, button it up, look at the obstruction of justice, and send it to the Senate. Wow. Get it off the plate. Uh, I... I could speculate till the cows come home. I'll tell you what I find uh, oftentimes when dealing with China is a very strange environment in which, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a conservative Republican. Yeah, yeah. Ronald Reagan and, and George Bush. And you work for Bush. some very fine men. I, I really have. I've been Jerry honored. Jerry Solomon and Dan Burton are mm -hmm. two courageous guys. And, and, and I was pleased to do that. What I found is that, ironically, I have natural allies on the far left. Honest liberals. Because they worry about human, human rights. Human rights. And they are with me every step of the way on that. And there's there's two groups here. And in the middle, though, it's this kind of well trade. It's 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 too important. They they kind of assuage their conscience by having this policy of let China develop. The, the tragedy is that uh, among elected officials of both major parties, there's a heavy reliance on campaign contributions. Correct. Many campaign contributions come from businesses that directly or indirectly do business with communist China and they're compromised by that business. What they, and to make their case for them, they say, well, if they just see American goods, you know, all of a sudden they'll go the way of the Soviet Empire. I have a little experience here. I also work for Ed Derwinski, who founded the Captive Nations. I was in Poland just after the wall came down. We saw Ronald Reagan and his team target solidarity with labor unions, by the way, help, and the Pope, religion, to see that was the way you'd wedge into the Soviet Empire and take it down. We did, they did it with fax, I did it, they did it with fax machines, information, and yes, it worked. China saw that. They understood what happened. They, quote, don't want to get the Polish disease. So instead, all this free trade is really just giving them a lot of money and communications networks that enable them to maneuver their troops to step on their people. Many analysts whom I greatly respect believe that communist China is potentially a far greater threat to the United States than the Soviet Union ever was because of communist China's economic power which the Soviets were never able to emulate. That and, and one other issue. In the book we have a timeline. When you do timelines it's very interesting. Uh, the Soviet Union killed an awful lot of people. Black Book of Communism published in France. It's not a, you know, it's a French book. Uh, holds the PRC leadership accountable for anywhere 60 to 80 million deaths in their 50 years history. We show a timeline. 50, they invade Tibet. 50, they helped. They were actually troops that came down into South Korea. They hit 
uh, India in 92, I mean, uh, in 62. Border skirmishes with the Soviet Empire uh, in the late 60s. They invaded Vietnam in 79. When they go about promising the use of force, they eventually do it. They have made direct threats now on the island nation, in my opinion, of Taiwan. I see Taiwan as a bastion of freedom. They now have free democracy, 22 million people, fifth largest economy in Asia, and the People's Republic of China are deathly afraid of Taiwan. I really believe that they're paper thin as far as their fear of controlling their people. When you see them or read about them grabbing grandmothers, which they're doing today as we speak probably, they've just done it yesterday, out of out of Tiananmen men who just want to do breathing exercises and put them in labor camps for a couple of years. They are afraid of their own people. The propping up of the People's Republic of China through some of the uh, excess trade and the dual-use technology is something that we will have to live with until they either crumble or they do something nasty which may be take Taiwan in the near term. We only have a couple of sure. uh, minutes in this segment. Talk to me about uh, dual-use technology and the history of U.S. policy vis-a-vis China, Red China, on technology transfer. Well, again, I, I was blessed to work for, for Representative Solomon, who, gosh, he fought everybody on this one. <laughs> he fought even President Reagan on some of these issues. But what we found is that uh, in the Clinton administration, to remind your viewers that the coddling of the butchers of Beijing was what he threw at George Bush. How dare we have a man who coddles the butchers of Beijing? This is what Clinton said in the campaign. Correct. He becomes president, and all of a sudden, all the export controls go away. They move to commerce. Now, we, uh, for our viewers, export controls are part of a system whereby we look at what we're selling overseas to see if even though it has a putatively Correct. commercial purpose, it could be used against us militarily. That is exactly right. All that was lowered. Those guards were lowered. Missile technology was transferred. Uh, Supercomputers. That's I, the one I was amazed us. to see that even the Republican Senate voted for some of these transfers at an earlier point. They've now switched. Yes. But uh, at an early point in the Clinton administration, they went along with it saying, well, China's not a threat, right. and, and the business is important, and by uh, letting them be part of our system and promoting free markets, we can change them. But actually, free market totalitarianism does not help the United States of America. You could not be more correct on that. I could not agree with you more. I don't have any problem with wheat and beanie babies. I mean, you know, let right. them do that. Right. But the rest of this stuff, let's get back to some sanity because they have made yeah. threats and they're rebuilding their military. Yeah, but let's take a break. Sure. When we come back, a lot of things we need to discuss. One of them is the Spratly Islands. Please stay with us. We're going to be talking about whether or not Red China now or soon poses a threat to the security of our country. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Howard Phillips, Chairman of the Conservative Caucus. I'm inviting you to learn more about the Conservative Caucus, a grassroots public policy action organization that was founded in 1974. Whether you're opposed to socialized medicine, interested in making Congress more accountable, stopping the New World Order, fighting gun control, reducing taxes, or restoring America to its biblical premises and constitutional boundaries, we're the organization you're looking for. Please call the number on your screen to get more information about our work. For more information, write the Conservative Caucus, 450 Maple Avenue East, Vienna, Virginia, 22180, or call 703-938-9626. Here's how you can become a citizen lobbyist and influence how your representatives vote. Write a letter to your congressmen and senators. Speak out on a call-in talk radio program. Write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper and call the Conservative Caucus for more information at 703-938-9626. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips. I'm here with best-selling author Ed Timberlake. This book, Year of the Rat, was on the New York Times bestseller list for 20 weeks. There's another book, Red Dragon Rising, which congressional investigator, Annapolis graduate, fighter pilot Ed Timberlake co-authored with Bill Triplett. We were talking about the communist Chinese threat. The uh, American people have been numbed into a sense of uh, passivity. They don't realize That's that true. defense spending is 
as a share of GNP lower than any time That's true. since before Pearl Harbor. That's exactly right. And they don't realize the degree to which our military capabilities have been decimated. While we've been uh, cutting down, even as taxes have been rising, social spending has been going up, Communist China has not been idle. What is the condition of the Communist Chinese military? What have they been doing? Uh, and what are the uh, apparent uh, goals of their buildup, as it now appears? Well, you're exactly right. Our curve is down. In fact, a couple months ago, for the first time since 1937, we didn't have an operational carrier in the Pacific. Today, front page, Washington Post, two Army divisions, our C-4, which means they really can't go into combat. So we're this way. People's Republic of China studied our doctrine, studied our tactics, and paid attention to some of the people I worked for and admired, because they presented some ways in which the revolution in military affairs will affect the future of warfare. Uh, there are two pillars to that, um, presented by Andy Marshall, a brilliant man. One pillar is precision guided munitions. These missiles that can reach out with remote sensors and uh, fly in and, and go down a window. Well, they saw us in Desert Storm do that. They wanted to learn how to do it, and now they can. Through our aid, our comfort, our technology, their precision guided munitions are superb, and their warehouses and their uh, silos are stocked with probably many more than we have at this point. That's one half of it. And by the way, the tragedy is not simply that we're giving it to them or that our private sector with government approval is doing it. Some of the countries we've been helping around the world have been doing it too. I read a, an article today in Financial Times uh, that Israel had turned over to Communist China some very sensitive uh, radar material. Is that something of which you're aware? Well, we're reading reports that there's an upgrade of an aircraft. Uh, it has to do with air control. Uh, they are using, I believe, a Russian jet, they're hollowing, exactly. a Russian transport they're hollowing out. Uh, I think it's in, in R&D at this point. Um, what we found, though, is uh, more often than not on the issue of weapons transfers, anything that People's Republic of China get, they can sell. So what has happened is that a lot of this high-tech stuff, I'm diverging here, but a lot of this high-tech stuff goes to Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Libya, which, you know, puts a, 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 a nation that I would, I worked with the people in Israel, I would defend, you know, sure. as one of our number one allies in the world, our number one ally in the world, in, in that part of the world, put them at great risk. So, so and Taiwan, same thing. So what we see is bad things into China, they sell it to bad people. But going back to what they visualize as the future warfare, the other half of precision guided munitions is information warfare, using computers to go to the homeland. Uh, right now, there's a dust up. They're either going at Taiwan on this. There's a kind of a mini war going on right now with computers both sides. Uh, Taiwan's vulnerable. What it tells us, though, is that information warfare for the first time uh, since this really surrender at Appomattox, Americans have been blessed. Uh, not since the surrender of the Confederacy have there been casualties in war on American soil. Four hours of Pearl Harbor, that's yeah, great horror, and poor islanders in the Aleutians in World War II were also attacked, and at two in Kiska. But uh, really, America has been blessed with a heartland that hasn't been touched. Well, information warfare, as preached and practiced and studied by the People's Republic of China, can reach out and touch America in some very horrible ways. We have a whole chapter dedicated to that. We found American uh, defense experts are very concerned about some of our vulnerabilities, as we would. And we're it's not just missiles. It's not just uh, a Chinese uh, general threatening to launch missiles no, on Los Angeles. No, they could, they could start fires in refineries and, and burn down several large cities. I mean, you can just do that sort of thing with computers now. We're a bit vulnerable. I don't want to be alarmist on it, but what I'm going to tell your listeners, your viewers, is that in looking at their doctrine and looking at their tactics, they are already awarding doctorates to military officers for information warfare skills. Here's a unique thing we found. Uh, the president, we were talking earlier in the first segment about uh, the relaxation of exports. Uh, Chairman Cox, brilliant report, bipartisan, said we're being penetrated. The high-tech stuff has gone out the door. It's dangerous. has a whole section on supercomputers. This is, it's, it's really high-tech high, uh, high computers with certain definitions, but it's in the book, and it's, it's, it's euphemism supercomputers. 600, 600 of them went to China. By now, probably 800 or so are over there. Why is that significant? Because we found a year before they showed up, inside the Chinese press, they were recruiting students to work, quote, on supercomputers. They knew ahead of the game that they were going to probably get these things. Why? Well, the first book is money in, favors out. It's a bribery case. So they, this so, is the consequence. So they have a president of the United States who they bought, 
and they know what he's going to deliver to them. Well, that seems to be the evidence stacking up here. And uh, now, let me play devil's advocate. Sure. The one uh, evidentiary support for Clinton not being in the bag for the Chinese is that when they threatened to Taiwan several years ago, he went along with sending uh, portions of uh, the U.S. Navy uh, as sort of a warning to China. How did that happen? Well, he was goaded into it by the U.S. Congress, and in Year of the Rat, we have a chapter. And uh, he was forced, to, his hand was forced by a lot of pressure, probably your grassroots effort, quite very bluntly. I'm sure he had a lot to do with it. And uh, those carriers showed up. Um, well, it turns out Charlie Tree, when they showed up, took $460,000, literally in a bag now. This is the bag man. Dumps it on the president's personal charity that he liked the most, his legal defense fund. Now, if someone gives a dollar to my attorney, that's a dollar to me. There's no soft money. There's no hard money. There's no political money. That's directly money to Bill Clinton. The same day, Charlie Tree gives $460,000. He goes to lunch with a, a White House official who's pled the fifth and uh, handed him a memo. Who's that official? Mark Middleton. Okay. At the Palm Restaurant. Right. At 119, that memo goes into the president at the highest levels of the National Security Council. The memo written by Charlie Tree, which I doubt he really wrote, because I've seen his other writings, it's unintelligible, is a direct... He used to write menus. Yes. Yeah, he was actually a fry cook and a greeter in a Chinese restaurant in Little Rock, and it made member triad um, of the Four Seas Gang. What we found, though, is that that memo was very blunt. It said, you'll have trouble in your re-election. I'm paraphrasing. You better pay attention. China has history of going to war over things like this. This is delivered at the height of the crisis. President Clinton takes that letter very seriously, fires back a letter saying, you're right, those carriers weren't there to threaten you. That answer was bought by $460,000, going to the President's Legal Defense Fund, memo going over, and the President of the United States responding. I'll challenge anyone watching this show, write to the President of the United States and see if they turn around an answer to your letter like that. Douglas MacArthur said that Formosa, another name, beautiful island for Taiwan, is like a giant aircraft That's carrier correct. floating in the Pacific. And it really is. That's correct. As long as Formosa, Taiwan, is there, anti-communist, independent of the People's Liberation Army, there's a limit on what communist China can do. That's correct. They cannot take over the Far East. They cannot be a worldwide threat to the United States. So their number one strategic objective has to be to neutralize Taiwan. And that's, that's right. what they're trying to do. I believe that that's one of the reasons they're moving into Panama. Because if they are in Panama uh, and are in a position to be physically proximate to the United States, if over the next five or ten years they can, they can consolidate economic power and maybe other kinds of power in the Caribbean, uh, it further limits our ability to defend Taiwan and undermines the confidence and independence of the people on Taiwan who are worrying about what uh, the Chinese could do to undermine their economy. Because as you know, Red China doesn't have to invade Taiwan to disrupt Taiwan. If they simply frighten the markets there, they'll demoralize the leaders. Yes, in fact, uh, uh, Panama, you have probably had many shows on this, is, is, is the worst case than you can imagine in one respect. I talked to friends who just went down and did an investigation. Costco, uh, Hutchinson Wampa has both ends of the canal, big fences up now. Uh, but all of a sudden it's uh, rapprochement with Cuba. And uh, you're starting to see, uh, they're really clever. This they're, is Clinton's rapprochement with Cuba. We're now <laughs> seeing the PRC book in through there Panama. Are, there are plane flights, there yeah. are ball games, and you've got the PRC building a position in Cuba. Correct. So what you're seeing is a gradual encirclement of America. Uh, I've talked to Canadians. All over the world, China's gone for choke points. They've very, 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 very actively. Straits of Malacca. Yes, sir. Everywhere. Spratley's. No, that's yeah. not a choke point, by the way. Um, also into Canada. Uh, the Canadian government has talked to them. They're very concerned about triad activity on our northern border. Uh, which leads me to believe now that the one prescription is to, 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 to hold it periphery. We have to do that, but take the fight back like Ronald Reagan and, uh, and Mr. Casey did and look at them and take the fight Stop back. Stop helping them and start checking them. We're going to talk about some of exactly those specifics. Right. When we return after this break, we're talking about this very important new book, Red Dragon Rising, with his author, Ed Timberlake. Stay with us. In every major war of the 20th century, control of the Panama Canal has been strategically crucial to America's military. Now the great U.S. Navy is no longer a two-ocean navy. 
and the Red Chinese military knows very well that control of the isthmus is more important than ever. That's why Red China now seeks control of the two crucial ports on each side of the Panama Canal. If Congress fails to give our military the funds to maintain U.S. bases in Panama, Red China will fill the vacuum, giving a communist superpower a hammerlock grip on the path between the seas. Right now, there's no money in the defense budget to keep our U.S. bases in Panama. And even as we reduce our defense spending, Red China boosts theirs with 40 billions of dollars each year coming from us as the result of MFN, most favored nation status. We the people, along with our leaders in Congress and at the White House, have a duty to preserve, protect, and defend America's vital interests. Today. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips with Ed Timberlake, co-author of this must-read book, Red Dragon Rising. You can find it in your bookstore. What is to be done? Well, we have to take, we have to bring this up as a national agenda for the campaign. Every president has to uh, every potential every presidential candidate has to face up to this as an issue. They have to be held accountable on really three points. One, rebuilding the military. Two, our military. Our not military, theirs. right? Exactly. <laughs> Two making sure they have a realistic policy, they take China as it is and make prescriptive remedies. And three, they immediately promise to stop weapons proliferation. That has to be stopped. The world is going to be awash in more and more weaponry thanks to China. I think if they just at least address those issues, we've made tremendous progress. Talk about this baloney called strategic partnership. Well, that's, that's the worst, it's the worst policy I've ever seen in U.S. history. Bill Clinton has the chutzpah to suggest that these butchers, these totalitarians, these people who've declared us their main enemy are our partners. We're sharing information with them. That's correct. We're showing them secrets of our training, of our practices. We, well, they, they were invited into Top Gun. I, you know, I was a graduate of the senior officer course, didn't fly, flew aggressor out there for a while with my reserve squadron. Uh, when you see tactics, the people develop tactics by, by death. I mean, Can't Congress stop this? It's, it's tough when you don't have an attorney general that will prosecute criminals. As an original source, I was lied to by various people, which is against the law, by the way. We turned it over for referrals, uh, and nothing ever happened. There's much to be done. Your book is an important beginning. Thank you. Ed, thanks for being well, with thank us. Thank you. Thanks for watching us.